Dear God, I just thank you so much for all you've done for us, and I just pray that you continue to watch Father out God, for us. Father God, thank you so much for children, every blessing that you presented in my life, and I pray that you Lord, just help me to put you first with all my me, actions and all my Jesus, salamat sa sakripisyo ng ginawa mo para sa akin sa cross. Iliktas mo ako at all right, what's up, everybody? Great to see you guys. Hey, welcome to Real Life. If it's your first time with us, man. We are so stoked that you're here. Thanks for checking us out this weekend. I want to welcome all of our campuses and those of you that might be joining us online as well. So grateful for you. Man, I love you all. Grateful for this place. And it's always fun for me when I look at my calendar and say, real life, yes. And I'm looking forward to being here maybe four or five times this fall. So I'm excited about that. Uh, we're in this series that we're calling Pray First. And we're going to see a prayer today that I think might change the way you talk to God. Now, some of you know, uh, I, I've been around a long time at this place. Uh, some of you know I like to watch sports. Now, I rarely watch a whole game. I rather like catch the highlights, you know, those top 10 plays that make you rewind and go, oh, that's unbelievable. I got to see that again, right? Yeah, you ever been stuck in traffic? You're sitting on the freeway, you're waiting, you're bored when this car like pulls up next to you. It's like a 1965 Mustang that's been totally restored and you go, whoa, that is really cool. Makes you do a double take, right? Maybe you download uh, like a new album and track number four just grabs you and you hit repeat. You go, man, I got to hear that again because we are never, ever, ever getting back together. Or maybe a back to school sign. You've been cruising the, the mall for those back to school sales. You see the sign says everything on sale, 50% off. And this outfit in the window kind of makes you stop and go, whoa, that's cool. I think I'm going to go try that on. Or maybe you're a single adult. And every now and then in a crowd of people at Real Life Church, a certain guy or a certain girl just catches your eye and that person makes you do a double take. Whether it's people, events, or images on a screen, sometimes your attention gets captured just unexpectedly. And the Bible is like that sometimes. I mean, sometimes you're reading along and something just jumps off the page at you and makes you do a double take. My wife, Debbie, and I, we've been uh, tracking through the Bible this year, starting in Genesis on. Some of you might be doing that as well. When you get to a book called First Chronicles, you find some pretty labor-intensive reading, 600 genealogies, like name after name after name after name of unpronounceable name. And then something happens that makes you do a double take. In First Chronicles chapter 4, all these names are being listed. And it's like God reaches down with a yellow fluorescent marker and highlights the name of a guy named Jabez. And you go, who is that? And not only is his name highlighted, there's a little thumbnail sketch that tells us simply, oh, he's the guy that prayed. There was a best-selling book that came out 22 years ago now by Bruce Wilkinson called The Prayer of Jabez. And not only was it the best selling religious book of 2001, it was the best selling book of that entire year of all books. And it's based on that little obscure pause in the genealogy records about a guy who simply prayed. And he prayed a life changing kind of prayer. And we've been talking about prayer in recent weeks. And like everybody who has already taught in this series, I'm no expert on prayer either. I mean, is anybody? But I am learning that a huge part of walking with God is talking to God, just living in the awareness of his presence and keeping those lines of communication open all day through, all, all through the day. And maybe as we've been doing this series, you've been wondering, like, why pray? I mean, what's the use anyway? If God already knows everything, then like, what's the point of prayer? Can you really change the mind of God? Does he even care in the first place? Do our requests even get heard? Do they seem trivial? To a very busy God? Can you even get through? Can you use up all your data space or, or are there unlimited minutes? Why pray? Let me offer this up. 
because we can't help it. We can't help it. Every religious faith has some form of prayer. I mean, tribal people for centuries have been pleading, singing, dancing before the gods for healing, for rain, for good crops and protections. Muslims stop and face toward Mecca five times a day and pray to Allah. People in AA or NA begin to pray to a higher power to help them get their unmanageable lives back on track. I think it's because it is hardwired within all of us. I am convinced that every one of our souls long to connect with the one true God who made us. Even if we're not sure about his identity. Even if we don't really believe in him. Even when he seems distant, we still long to connect. I mean, think about it. We pray because we're empty. We pray because we're grateful. We pray because we're scared. We pray because we feel helpless. We pray for answers on a test. We pray for tests to come back from the lab. We, we pray for a deal to go through at work. We pray for our dad to be healed. We pray for forgiveness. We pray for peace. We pray for strength. We pray for the assurance that we're not alone. You hit some unexpected turbulence on an airplane, everybody is praying. <laughs> we can't help it. It's hardwired within us. Search the pages of Scripture and you will see Abraham prayed, Moses prayed, David prayed, Nehemiah prayed, Daniel prayed, Ezekiel, Ruth, Elijah, Mary, Peter, Paul, and the most eye-opening person that prayed? Jesus himself. Over and over in the Gospels, it says that Jesus would often sneak away to quiet places and just hang with his father talking to him. He knew the value of praying to his father. So when doubts creep into my life, and I start wondering, does prayer really matter? I'm reminded that Jesus, the one who spoke the universe into existence, felt this compelling need to pray. In fact, his number one passion was talking to his father and the way he moved through his life with courage and joy and the incredible energy he possessed for loving people in the radical, inclusive way that he did, his ability to teach with wisdom and clarity, his ability to deal with criticism and give extra grace to very, very difficult people, all of that flowed out of his intimacy with his father. All of it flowed out of those times where he embraced prayer as a lifeline. In fact, you know the only thing the disciples ever asked Jesus to teach them? I mean, you would think it would be, hey, Jesus, uh, you think you could teach us that water and the wine trick? That'd be like a great party trick. Hey, Lord, you think you could teach us that multiply the bread and, and fish thing, that, that wave walking thing you do? That'd be cool. Can you teach us that? Nope. You know what they asked him? They said, Lord, um, you think you could teach us to pray? You see, they saw the very real life-giving connection that talking to the Father gave Jesus, and so they wanted it too. They said, Lord, you, you think you could teach us to pray like that? So whenever I wonder about why I pray, it helps me remember, oh, Jesus, he prayed. And so did this guy who lived a long time before Jesus ever showed up on the scene. Jabez is simply described as the one who prayed. And I think his prayer can teach us a few things. This is what it says about him. Let me read 1 Chronicles chapter 4. We'll throw it up on the screen. It says this, Now Jabez was more honorable than his brothers, and his mother called his name Jabez, saying, Because I bore him in pain. There's a couple of things here. He's described, first of all, as more honorable. Now we don't know exactly what made him that way, but we do know qualities like integrity, honesty, compassion, courage, humility are the things that people who are described as more honorable, are made of. And the thing that elevated Jabez above the rest, the thing that made him stand out, the thing that gave him this honorable mention, if you will, was not his looks, not his talent, not his stats, not his grades, not his position, his position or his title. It was the fact that he prayed. He, he humbly sought God's involvement in his life. And I don't know, but maybe he prayed because of his name. Did you catch that? Did you catch the name his mom gave him? I'll name him Jabez because I bore him in pain. Now, we're not sure what happened with Jabez. We don't know whether his mom had a you know, horrible pregnancy, a rough delivery, uh, whether he had some sort of birth defect or physical problem, or whether his dad bailed out on him and his mom. But for some reason, Jabez was connected with pain and grief. In fact, his name, Jabez, literally in Hebrew means pain, grief, anguish. Can you imagine 
an expectant mom scrolling through a list of possible baby names and going, ooh, Payne, that's a good one. That's really cute. I think I'll name him Payne after his father. Uh, but back in biblical days, and still in many cultures, your name really like meant something. When somebody articulated your name, they and everybody else knew what it meant. So Jabez had a negative label to overcome from the start. You imagine choosing up teams that go, I'll take courage, I'll take laughter, I'll take fire. You got pain. We don't want him. Now, it might not be a name, but I can imagine that some of us have had some difficult labels to overcome as well. Maybe somebody, whether it was a parent or a coach or a teacher or some childhood friend on the playground, a play, playground bully, a co-worker, stuck a label on your life. Maybe called you fat or stupid or uncoordinated or ugly and, and you live with that label for most of your growing up years you always felt like you would never amount to anything and the tragedy is some of us still live under that label still believe in that junk in fact it'd be my guess is some of you have internalized it for so long that you actually believe what they said or continue to say about you over and above what God has to say about you and I think that maybe God is saying to you and me, do what Jabez did. Morph your pain into prayer. Talk to me about it. Listen to me. Let me define you. Refuse to be labeled. Don't believe the lies. Don't think you don't matter. Don't think you can't make it. Don't think you don't have the ability. Don't think that God is not for you. Talk to me. Pray. Let me get involved in your life. So here's the prayer that Jabez prayed. It says this in verse 10. And Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that you would bless me indeed and enlarge my territory, that your hand would be with me, and that you would keep me from evil that I might not cause pain. And so God granted him what he requested. Now, there's four parts to that prayer you probably noticed. And when he begins by saying, Bless me indeed, indeed in the Hebrew language was much more powerful than ours. This was a turn up the volume, like put 18 exclamation points behind it kind of term. He's praying, bless me indeed. This was him coming to God saying, fill my cup, Lord, and I'm bringing a 50-barrel drum with me. You see, Jabez had grown up hearing all about how God has supernaturally delivered his people from slavery in Egypt. He had grown up seeing how God had given them the promised land. He believed great things about God. He believed that God could do anything. And he knew that God wanted great things from him and for him. So Jabez wanted to access the supernatural greatness of God into his life. Even in the middle of whatever pain meant to him, he wanted to know the blessing of God. So he asked for it. Now, I want to hit pause just for a second and say this. I believe that one of the reasons that book, The Prayer of Jabez, was a bestseller is because people like stuff like that. Five life-altering principles to make your business soar. Three easy steps to better abs. Two simple ways to improve your marriage. And sometimes people see this prayer as four easy steps to a healthy, wealthy life. For some, it's almost like they found this old lamp washed up on the beach and discovered there was a genie inside. And now i got a formula to get God out of the bottle and work in his magic for me. This prayer is not about our wish being his command. To pray, bless me indeed, is not to say, hey God, I want this and I want that and you better give it to me because I prayed the prayer, God. Come on, come on, give me the stuff. Come on, I'm waiting for the blessing. I prayed the formula. Come on, in case you haven't still noticed, I still got that old car. I still got 37 bucks on my checking account. Come on, God. I prayed the prayer. I recited it word for word. I rubbed the lamp. <coughs> Excuse me. No, to ask God, <coughs> bless my voice, God, <coughs> indeed, <coughs> to ask God to bless is to humbly cry out for the unlimited goodness and wisdom that only he can deliver. It's acknowledging a desperate need for his will and his supernatural involvement in your life. It's saying basically, God, I need you. I need you indeed. I want your blessing on my life. I want my life to count. I want to do great things. I want to go on great adventures for you. But if I'm going to count, 
God, if I'm going to make a difference, if I'm going to make any changes in my life, if I'm even going to be able to take another breath into my lungs, I want to come to you and tell you I need you in my life. I can't do this on my own. So I'm putting my life in your hands, and I'm asking you to bless my life. Bruce Wilkinson writes this, when we ask God's blessing, we're not asking for more of what we could get for ourselves. We're asking for the supernatural involvement of God in our life. And when you've got that, you've got everything. No wonder, no wonder it says this in Proverbs 10, it says, God's blessing makes life rich. Nothing we do can improve on God. I mean, when you have the blessing of God on your life, you can't get better than that. He walks with you every day, talks with you, guides you, changes you, reminds you, puts you in places of great opportunity. He gives you peace and confidence and gentleness, the ability to control your temper and impulses and habits and addictions. He gives you a sense of accomplishment, a sense of security, even when things are falling apart around you, all because you asked him, please get involved in my life. God wants to bless us like that. And he knows what is best for us, so don't put him in a box concerning his blessings and what they look like. Sometimes they are relational. Sometimes they are physical, sometimes even financial. Sometimes they're <coughs> very simple and quiet <coughs> and a bit obscure. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Sometimes God's blessings are loud and colorful to pour all over your head. Sometimes they're disguised through tragedy even. And you look back one day and you realize how much God blessed your life through even that. Jabez's secret was to instead of being enticed by what the world defines as blessings, instead of trying to figure out how to manipulate people in the system to grab all the blessings he could find on his own, he just prayed daily that he would want nothing more than the God who sees the big picture wanted for him. He said, bless me indeed. And then, he, then he added this, oh, oh Lord, would you expand my territory? Now Jabez was praying for boundaries to change and, and land was already allocated in the, in the Old Testament. And according to Old Testament law, it was a pretty big sin to move boundary lines. So rather than take matters into his own hands, he was more honorable than that. He knew the only way his territory was ever going to expand was through a supernatural move of God. So he asked God to do that. Now, when I pray this prayer, I'm not asking for more land. I got more than I can mow and mulch and weed now. But I'm praying, Lord, would you increase my sphere of influence and impact? Would you open my eyes to the opportunities and the people all around me today? Help me honor you in every interaction I have with these people and make this day count for eternity. And I like this open my eyes approach to this because here's the deal. Your territory is already a lot larger than you think it is. I, I get to teach at a, a church in Dallas and I heard about two Texas cowboys bragging about their ranches. You know how everything is bigger in Texas. Uh, one guy said, yeah, my ranch is so big. I I got in my truck at dawn and drove to one end of it, turned around, and by the time I got back, it was dark, and my truck was out of gas. Other guys said, yeah, I used to have a little truck like that too. <laughs> we can ask God for larger territory, but the truth is, our territory is already huge. Just look around you. It, it's a lot bigger than you think it is. I, I'm sure Jesus heard his disciples the longer they hung around with him. Talk about how they would really like to be somebody someday. That they would really like to make a difference someday, be used by God someday. He may have even heard them talking about Jabez. They've been sitting around and saying, hey, you ever hear about that? The way that one guy, that, what was his name? Was Jabez? The guy Payne? Remember how he prayed about God expanding his territory? Yeah, maybe, maybe we ought to pray that prayer. Maybe he'll do that for us someday. Well, in John chapter 4, there's a story about a crowd of people unexpectedly coming out of a town to meet Jesus, and he turns to his guys and says, someday is here, boys. He says this, don't you have a saying? It's still four months until harvest. I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. So don't keep waiting for someday to make a difference in somebody's life. 
He's saying, open your eyes, look around, someday is already here. Maybe for you, your expanded territory is a family member. Maybe it's a coworker, a teammate, or a neighbor. And you're praying, God, I really want to make a difference. I really want you to expand my territory. And God says, okay, open your eyes. They're sitting right across the breakfast table from you. Open your eyes. They're working right down the assembly line from you. Open your eyes. Their school locker is right next to yours. Open your eyes. They're rolling out their trash cans two doors down. Open your eyes. They're serving you a refill on your coffee right now. Open your eyes. They're lying in a nursing home waiting for a visit. Open your eyes. They're sitting on the couch right now with a basketball on their lap just waiting for you to come home and play. You see, if we're not careful, this prayer, expand my territory, can become a very selfish prayer. Where God, expand my influence, my advancement, my reputation, my portfolio, my grandeur, my glory. That's why you say to God, God, this prayer is not about me and more. It's about you broadening my perspective, widening my inclusivity, and opening my eyes to the opportunities that are already around me. And then Jabez prays this. He says, God, if you bless my life indeed, and if you expand my territory, then I'm really going to need your hand to be with me. I'm going to need your strength. I'm going to need your wisdom, your guidance, your presence with me at all times. I'm going to need to feel your hand upon me. Any of you students good at math? Anybody good at, good at math? Yeah, I, I, I was pretty good at math and, until I got to the level where the, you started using formulas and hypotheses and logarithms. That's when I disembarked the trigonometry train and took shop class. I'm not real gifted with equations and such. Not so with Jabez. He could do the math. I mean, he could see the formula. And this was the formula. Blessing plus expansion equals inadequacy. He's thinking, okay, God, I'm asking you to bless my life. I'm asking you to expand my territory, increase my sphere of influence, and open my eyes to the opportunities around me. And uh, you know what? If, uh, If you answer that prayer... I want you to know I will be inadequate to the task. I know if you bless me and expand my territory, I'm going to be ill-equipped, outmanned, outgunned. I will have outkicked my punt coverage. I will feel like a seventh grader trying to block Aaron Donald. I will be clueless and lost as the next step. So, God, I'm going to need your strong hand on my life. You know, after all these years, I get nervous Every time I preach, I don't cough every time I preach, but I get nervous every time I preach. Uh, Trying to lead people and help people can be overwhelming and honestly intimidating. And I am confronted all the time with my personal inadequacy. And even though I admittedly, I said I'm mathematically challenged, I can still do this math. Blessing plus expansion (laughs) equals inadequacy. In fact, every person, every church that has ever been used by God knew this formula. They depended upon the mighty hand of God to hold them strong, sustain their courage, and guide their steps. It says this about the very first church in the book of Acts, and the Lord's what? Hand was with them. And a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. Why did a great number of people turn to the Lord? Because the early church depended upon the Lord's hand to lead them. And gang, we can do nothing as a church at real life apart from the hand of God being on us. And that's why we will stay humble and dependent and keep asking for his supernatural involvement in our lives and the life of our church. Jabez had heard all about the hand of God on people. He knew that the mighty hand of God on behalf of his grandfather, his great-grandfather, his great-great-grandfather, and maybe they even read this scripture to them from Deuteronomy 26 where it said, Then we cried out to the Lord, the God of our fathers, and the Lord heard our voice and saw our misery, toil, and oppression. So the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm with great terror and miraculous signs and wonders. He brought us to this place and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Maybe Jabez has seen the altar, a simple stone memorial right next to the Jordan River where Joshua and the people crossed over. And it says this in Joshua 4, he said to the Israelites, in the future when your descendants ask their fathers, what do these stones mean? Tell them. Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the Jordan before 
before you until you had crossed over. The Lord your God did to the Jordan just as he had done to the Red Sea when he dried it up before us until we had crossed over. He did this so that all the peoples of the earth might know that the hand of God is powerful and that you might always fear the Lord your God. Jabez had heard the stories. He knew the people of faith. He knew about the greatness of God, and he wanted to download that greatness into his life. He said, God, I need your hand upon my life. So let's just read that prayer again. He called on the God of Israel saying, Oh, that you would bless me indeed and enlarge my territory, that your hand would be with me and that you would keep me from evil that I might not cause pain. The last part of that prayer is so cool to me. Remember, his, his name means pain. And he prays, Lord, keep me from evil that I might not cause pain. It's almost like you're saying, God, I've, I've known pain. My name means pain. And I also know the only thing that evil does is inflict pain. And I don't want to be someone that carries on a legacy of pain. I mean, all of us have heard that hurt people hurt people, right? If you don't deal with the wounds, you will inflict wounds. But it doesn't have to be that way. You know what? Hate, Satan hates everybody. But you know who I think he especially hates? Cycle breakers. People who pray prayers like this. Keep me from evil. Help me walk with you, trusting your goodness and your healing power so that I won't continue to pass along pain to other people in my life. Surrounding the land in which Jabez lived, the Holy Land, were the Canaanites who were very self-centered pagan people living far from God, and they were bent on inflicting pain. And they had begun to influence the spiritual climate and the health of the nation of Israel. So Jabez prays, God, keep me. Keep me from going there. I saw a bumper sticker that read, lead me not into temptation. I'm perfectly capable of finding it on my own. <laughs> and we are, aren't we? That's why Jesus taught us to pray, and we're going to see it next week, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Because God, since I'm perfectly capable of finding it on my own, lead me away from it. I think Jabez knew, even back then, that blessings often get tailgated by an SUV. Susceptible, unguarded vulnerability. They just do. I was, I was riding in my truck with my with one, of, one of my grandsons the other day and we got talking about how people say that adversity when tough things happen in your life adversity is a real test of your faith and I told him I said I think that's true but listen Jack I, I believe that prosperity is a, a greater test of your faith I just do because if you're not careful blessings and expansion and success can leave you with a false sense of self-sufficiency and that leaves you susceptible unguarded and very vulnerable to temptation's power. That's why it's so important to know what your fatal flaws are, what could wreck your life if left unguarded. So just be honest with yourself and honest with somebody else and pray, Lord, keep me from going there. And when the temptation gets really, really strong, show me the escape route. Help me to listen and head that way. Because God, I do not want to cause pain in my own life. I don't want to cause pain in my family's life, my friend group, my team, my workplace, my neighborhood, or my church. I want to be known as more honorable than that. I met Janine a few weeks back, and she shared a bit of her story with me, how honest prayer, just raw, honest prayer changed her life. And she sat down with some of our team and shared some of her journey, how God answered that prayer, and what God, and what God has done in her life, I think will inspire you as it has me. Take a look. Hi, my name is Janine, and this is how I became a follower of Jesus after a lifetime of being an atheist. Even when I was a child, I didn't really think about God or give that any consideration. I ran everything on Janine Power, and I think I liked in some ways the sense of control that that gave me, even though it's really a false sense of control. And it kind of all started falling apart when I had a whole series of kind of unfortunate things that happened and my life kind of fell apart. The culmination of all that was when my mother passed away and my mother died late 
on a Saturday night. My youngest sister was in town because we knew that my mom's time was short. And she's a Christian. She wanted to go to church that Sunday morning. Really out of love and respect for my sister, I said, sure, let, let's go. And she went online and she found Real Life Church. And I was completely unprepared for what this church was like. The service just spoke to me in a way that I didn't see coming at all. And afterwards, my sister wanted to go. She said, let's go find the prayer team. And we went out in the lobby and they started praying and I had my head bowed and there was this puddle of tears that was forming on the floor. It was just all kinds of things coming out that I didn't even know were in me. I was just shaken to my core and I started coming back every week and I struggled. It's really difficult when you believe something your whole life or not believed it and something happens that upends what you believe at your core. And I kept coming and I'm three years into it by now and I'm still not ready. I don't think I'm a Christian. So I went to Hawaii on vacation. The night before I got there, there had been a big storm. I got up in the morning and I walked out onto the sand in my pajamas. I'm standing there in the surf and I just felt like I need to figure this out. I need an answer. And I just closed my eyes and I put my hands out and I asked that question, God, if you're there, give me a sign. As I was standing there, I felt something hit my ankle. It was just a piece of wood. Uh, huh, what's this? And I pulled it out of the surf and I turned it over and that's the sign that I got from God. And in that moment, I said, okay, I'm done. And I accepted Jesus Christ as my savior in that moment. It totally changed my life. And last summer, I got baptized at the beach. And that was one of the most transcendent experiences of my life. That doesn't mean that my life is perfect, but I have tools now. I don't have to do any of this alone. Right now, you can probably tell by my headgear <laughs> that I'm going through chemotherapy, but I'm not afraid. I have Jesus right by my side. I am so lifted up by prayer. I am so joyful and grateful every day. This is the life that I always wanted and I didn't even know I wanted it. If somebody hears this who's struggling the way that I was struggling, you may not get a sign quite as dramatic as that. But know that for me, it started with the prayer. It started with that puddle of tears on the floor. God is real. God is always in my heart, always in my thoughts, always walking with me. And I don't have to do anything alone ever again. That's so awesome. You know, prayer is, it's not a quick fix formula for success. It's not some coded incantation so God will become your personal concierge. Rather, it's just a humble prayer of dependence. Simply saying, Father, I want to know you. I want my life to count. And for that to happen, I need you in my life. So if you need a sign that God is real, I'm probably not one that's going to wash up on the shore for you. It could. But we're going to hold in our hands for the next few moments a little piece of bread and a cup of juice and God saying, here's your sign that I care. Here's your sign that I love you and I want to do life with you. If you, if you. if you need some communion elements, you can raise your hand. We'll make sure to get you some if you missed them on the way in. We're going to just spend a few moments uh, just uh, being still and talking to him. And uh, I just say, I invite you to bow your heads and let me just, uh, I invite you to pray as I just kind of lead us through a little bit here. Maybe we could just kind of Sit in the quiet and pray. God, bless me indeed. Bless me indeed. I need your supernatural involvement in my life. 
God, I'm asking that you would expand my territory. Open my eyes to the opportunities that are all around me already. God, I know I need your mighty hand on me. Your presence, your power, your guidance, your wisdom, I need it in my life. Maybe as you hold the emblems of communion in your hand, you just say, keep me from evil. Lead me not into temptation. Help me stay away from it so that evil won't bring pain into my life and the lives of other people. Jesus, you bore the pain that evil causes so we could be forgiven and free, so that we could live forever. And it is such a privilege to remember you right now, to express our gratitude to you right now, and honestly, just to talk to you. What a privilege it is to carry everything, everything to you in prayer. So that's what we do right now. I pray in your name.